This morning we're going to look at an important subject, what must I do to be saved? Now I realize some are thinking, I've heard that before. I'm absolutely convinced some messages you do not stray from. You must frequently go back and see, here's what the Bible teaches. Within an audience, an audience changes, and you never know but what there's someone who's not heard this message. Within that audience, it may be that some have come to a point where they're needing to hear that message again. And so we're looking at, what must I do to be saved? Now you've heard in your reading this morning, Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. On that particular occasion, they had been indicted with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. You know, we may have said their sin, it was the crucifixion of the Lord and Christ, but was it everyone? Did literally everyone standing before Peter and the apostles preaching stand outside of Pilate's hall crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Now certainly many of those people who stood outside Pilate's hall were probably present that day hearing the preaching of Peter. However, there were people coming from literally all around the world. There's at least 14 different places you read of that people had come from, nationalities, different languages represented. Were they there crying out, crucify him, crucify him? Or they had just lately come to celebrate this Pentecost. You know, what would Jesus have said if he were to accuse us would he have said you that have crucified the Lord in Christ or would he call more specific attention to sins that were present in a group of some size most sins probably are present those sins of the heart maybe he would say you who've had that jealous heart those of you who've been envious, or maybe those of you who've cheated, those of you who have lied, those of you who have mistreated your fellow man, you husbands who've mistreated your wives, you wives who've mistreated your husbands, you parents who've neglected your children, you children who failed to obey your parents, or maybe even cut at some sins that to mankind we may think, well, could they be worse? You adulterers, or maybe you murderers. Maybe he talks about sins that are so secret that you think nobody knows. And he indicts you for those sins. Well, maybe he would have. But I think, too, that Everyone is responsible for Jesus' death. That day, on that occasion, as Peter was preaching, standing up with the eleven, no, I don't think every person was present and outside of Pilate's hall crying out, crucify him, crucify him. I don't think that all of that crowd stood around the cross hurling insults. But the reality is every one of those people ultimately were responsible for the death of Jesus. As everyone sitting here is responsible for the death of Jesus. Looking at why Jesus died, Matthew 26, 28, Jesus himself said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of of sins. So he's speaking of why ultimately his blood would be shed, why he would go to the cross, And it is for the forgiveness of our sins. He used the word many there. When you get to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, you read, for there is one God. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all. In Matthew 26, 28, there the word many was used. Here the word all is used. We might say that the many of Matthew 26, 28 is defined by the word all in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. And so it is the case that Jesus went to the cross. He shed his blood 
for the remission of our sins. He became the ransom, the ransom for all. John puts it this way in 1 John 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, a long word. Propitiation, a word that we don't typically use in our everyday language. But it had to do with the appeasement of God because of our sins. It's as if Jesus is the one that made peace with us in God. Because our sins had separated us from God. He's a propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. One of the passages that to me just stands out when it comes to the cross and what Jesus did is 1 Peter 2.24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed again he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree I was not living at that first century time when Jesus was crucified. And you weren't living in that first century time when Jesus was crucified. But we are just as responsible for Jesus going to that cross as those people who did cry out, crucify Him, crucify Him. As those who cooperated with the Roman soldiers to arrest Jesus that night who pushed and goaded until Pilate said Jesus could be crucified. No, we were not the ones standing around the cross hurling insults at Jesus. But we are just as responsible for Jesus being on that cross as any of those people were. He is there because of our sins. If we were to have this piece of paper passed around and we were going to sign who Jesus died for, who sins he died for, everybody's name would be on that piece of paper. Yes, we are responsible for Jesus going to that cross. And aren't you thankful for Jesus and the cross? There is nothing which says to man, God loves you more than Jesus and the cross. There's nothing that says to man that God wants man to be saved like Jesus and the cross. In 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, Paul said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus, the cross, that is why we can be saved. And that was the message that was preached in Acts chapter 2. But friends, when those people on that day heard that message. They were pricked in their heart. They were convicted of their sin. They recognized that they had taken Jesus, who has been declared the Lord and the Christ, and they had had a part in his crucifixion. It's not surprising that they cry out, Brethren, what shall we do? This particular question, what shall we do, was asked really three times in the book of Acts. We find it at the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.37. We find similar words in Acts 22 verse 10, which would be similar to that account of Acts chapter 9 of the conversion of Saul. When Christ appeared to Saul, Saul asked, 
What shall I do, Lord? And then a third time we find this ask was when the Philippian jailer narrowly escaped death. And he says to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I would suggest to you that these three questions, or if you would, this one question, because all three of these questions are asking basically the same thing. But it's one of the most important questions that man could ask. Because it's asking how he responds to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Asking what responsibility he has in order to accept the grace of God. It's asking how we can begin that journey to heaven itself. Whether it's what shall we do? Or what shall I do, Lord? Or sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's getting at the heart of the most important question that man can ask. I want you to notice some things, though, that Peter did not say on that day. In fact, these are some things that you might hear people say today. But no, Peter did not answer the question in this way. Peter did not say, there's just too much guilt in the world. Sometimes people might respond in this way. Maybe it's because they have been made to feel overly guilty at parts of their life or times within their life, maybe not willing to change that for which they should have felt guilt. But nevertheless, he didn't just say, there's just too much guilt in the world, as it were, sidestepping the question itself. Neither did he say, you did nothing different than everyone else. You know, sometimes we like to excuse away our sin, our bad behavior, because, well, everybody else is doing it. No, there's no excuse. Everybody else doing it is still wrong. He didn't excuse the sin. He didn't say, don't feel bad. God wants you to be happy. Frankly, today, some people, they approach God in this fashion that God wants you to be happy. Whatever it takes to be happy, you can do. Whatever it takes for you to be happy, God's happy with. Now that's not the way it works. That's not the way the Bible's written. But yet some would give the impression, don't feel bad, God wants you to be happy. Neither did Peter say that day, you're asking this question speaks worlds about your heart. And this is what God is concerned about. Well, I have no doubt that God is concerned about the heart. And I think you would agree with that. But we'd also reckon that there's specifically some things that within Scripture we're told we're to do or we're not to do. It's not mer merely just the heart, but as well, what are we doing? We also would see that Peter did not say that day, you're asking this question indicates you've come to belief. This is all you needed to do. I do think in Acts chapter 2 verse 36 when he said you know assuredly or know for certain that God has made that same Jesus whom you've crucified both Lord and Christ. That, that was paramount saying you believe this. You know assuredly, know for certain, you believe this. That they responded being pricked in the heart. Men and brethren, what shall we do? I do think that's indicative that they come to that point of belief. But he didn't say, you've come to the point of belief, that's all you need to do. He gave them more of an answer than that. Neither did he say, pray this prayer. I guess for the last 40 to 50 years, it's been very commonplace to hear people say, pray this prayer with regards to salvation. In fact, commonly, it's called the sinner's prayer. You don't find the sinner's prayer within Scripture. You don't find that anyone within Scripture who asks the question about what must I do, we're told to pray a prayer. Actually, the sinner's prayer is is falling out of favor with many in the denominational world as compared to years ago. But yet, that, once again, if we say, well, what did Peter not say? Peter did not say, pray this prayer. And then also, Peter did not say, there's nothing for you to do. All of these things up here, 
I could imagine someone today saying, had they been Peter on the day of Pentecost, based on their theology, what they believe, what they teach now. But Peter didn't say any of these things. But rather we're going to see some things that he did say and see some great implications. First of all, there's certainly two ways. There is that way of acceptance and obedience. There is following that narrow way to life. Or there is the opposite of that, following that broad way to destruction. But there's two ways. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 tell us plainly about that broad way and about that straight and narrow way. And I would hope that as many on that day chose that straight and narrow way, that today people would choose the straight and narrow way as well. Anytime God's word is preached, there is always the possibility some will accept it as well as the possibility some will reject it. That some will obey it, that some will disobey it. And when they ask that question, what must we do? The answer, well, they could have chosen to obey or chosen to disobey. And the same thing exists today. We would also recognize another important thing is that salvation, a gift, is accepted through obedient faith. We already acknowledge that Acts 2 verse 36, when he said, No is surely or no for certain, was paramount to say, You believe, a command to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that Jesus has been made the Lord and the Christ. But friends, is faith or belief alone sufficient for salvation? In fact, we find that an obedient faith is necessary. In Matthew 7, 21, as Jesus was concluding that Sermon on the Mount, he said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There we see clearly obedience is necessary. As we look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, there we find in being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Clearly there, obedience is necessary. In no case, whether it's Matthew 7, 21 or Hebrews 5, 9, is obedience divorced or separated from faith. Rather, what we would have in Matthew 7, 21 or what we would have preached and spoken of in Hebrews 5, 9 is an obedient faith. In fact, as we then go further, we see in a specific way things that we are to do. We're first to believe in Jesus. In John 3, 16, we find that golden text of the Bible, for God so loved the world, that He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. We find that this faith that he spoke of in John 3, 16 is also spoken of as the power to become children of God. In John 1, beginning in verse 11, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Gave the right, or some translations, the power or some translations, the authority to become children of God. He didn't just say you became a child of God, but here you now have that right or authority to become a child of God. We do see that saving faith obeys. In John 3, 36, yes, sometimes we go to that golden text of the Bible, John 3, 16, but as you go to the end of that chapter, you read, Whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Interestingly, here you have this word believes. You might say in a similar place as obey. Very clearly, it was expected that the one who believed would obey. In fact, failing to obey, he said, you'll not see life. 
In James chapter 2, verse 14, you read, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Verse 17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. That word dead occurs several times within this passage. In James 2.20 you read, do you, not, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? I found it interesting in the sense that in the King James, New King James, this word is dead. The American Standard Version translates it barren. Bible and Basic English translates it of no use. New American Standard Bible also translates it useless. Now, it actually is that same word necros or dead that you find other places within James chapter 2. As you see what Thayer says about dead, you find number one, the physical sense of dead. Um, one who's breathed his last, lifeless. But you get down to the number two metaphorically. Well, there's the idea of spiritually dead. But you move on down that line, you get to 2A2, it says, inactive as respects doing right. Or 2B, destitute of force or power, inactive, op inoperative. That's where it's kind of like, is useless, it's vain, it's no good. And that's what the faith without works is. It's dead. But what he means there by dead is it's useless, it's vain, it's of no good or no value. Well, as you keep reading in James 2, verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The only time you'd find faith and alone just there beside each other is preceded here by not by faith alone. In verse 26, for the body apart from the spirit is dead. So also faith apart from works is dead. So all of these passages speaks of the necessity of faith and works. But here in James chapter 2, so clearly, faith without works is dead. So we're told to believe in Jesus, but it's a saving faith that obeys. We would find, secondly, that we are to repent of sins. We find in Luke 13, 3, Jesus preached, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I've heard some people say there are some life or death statements in the Bible. I would call this very much a life or death statement. In other words, you have life or death based upon whether or not you repent. In Acts 2.38, passage already read in your presence, it says repent and be baptized. And so there we find that we are to repent. Acts 17.30, the times of this ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Now if we are to say, well, what is it we're to repent of. And what is repentance? First of all, it's produced by godly sorrow. It's not just being sorry, but it is produced by godly sorrow. But repentance is a change of life being the result of repentance. In Acts 26, verse 20, you read, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent. Look at this now. Repent and turn to God performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. So repentance is a change, but it's a change that is appropriate for that repentance. Clearly this word means, it means change of mind. Repentance, change of mind. So when you think in terms of repentance, you think in terms of change. Yes, there's that faith, but then our life's got to change. We turn from that sin. We turn to God. We get out of the sinning business, as it were. We also read that we are to confess Christ. We find in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, where he speaks about we're to confess. And then he also tells us what happened if we, are to, if we deny him. And in Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul wrote there, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So we are to confess our faith in Christ. And we're also to be baptized. In Mark 16, 16, you read, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. In Acts 2, 38, repent, but he also then says, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Here he's telling us not only that we are to be Baptized, but he's telling us the very reason, purpose for that baptism, that it's for the forgiveness of sins. 
In addition to that faith, there is to be that change, repentance. There's to be that confession of faith and baptism. All of these working together, we respond to the grace of God and accept that salvation. Peter says it so plainly in 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. I've heard some people preach, and at the end of it, I only concluded that they would have changed the words of Peter in this passage to say, baptism does not save you. But he says now instead of not. Friends, we must be baptized to be saved. So when we ask the question, what must I do to be saved? We're asking a question that was asked three times in the book of Acts. And we see the cumulative answer, if you would, to that question is that I must have that faith, believe, turn from my sin, confess that faith, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. You know, we sang that song, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Yes, Jesus saves. But how, when, what must I do? That's been at the heart of what we've looked at here. And as I mentioned, when that message is preached, there can be one of two responses. That response could be obeyed. In Acts chapter 2, we read that about 3,000 that day, they that gladly received this word, were baptized. About 3,000. They accepted that message. They obeyed that message. What about others? Was everyone that day accepting of that message and obeyed that message? You know, we don't have that information in Acts 2. But I would suggest it's very, very doubtful that everybody, everybody who heard him obeyed. We can do one of two things. We can accept and obey, or we can reject and fail to obey. Sometimes people might be thinking of, well, maybe... Or maybe I ought to. Or maybe later. Well, the maybe might turn into obedience. The later may turn into obedience. But it could be that Satan uses that period of doubt and delay to snatch away the good word from the heart of that individual. And that obedience never comes. Or maybe even with good intentions, he has that later in mind. But then the reality is, later never comes. Maybe he doesn't have another opportunity. Maybe his life is taken away from him. And he's wasted that opportunity that he had. I hope that you would consider the message today, what must I do to be saved, and be determined, I'm going to do what Jesus tells me. If I'm not yet responded to this message to obey that, that I recognize now is the good time to do it. If you've responded to this message and obeyed, recognize then still that that message of what it means to live a Christian life, we must be accepting and obeying. If we could help you in your response this morning, if you want to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. This is a great morning to do so. If there's a need for prayer on your behalf, we'd be glad to take the time and pray for you. If you need to come, please come as we stand and sing.